Okay. Are we missing anyone? So, so we are looking at when markets don't work, when they break down, why we need to use the law. We need to use the law when the market won't allow us to get to the solution. In democratic countries, nor liberal countries, normally you just let the market, the idea is you let the market take care of many issues, and only when the market doesn't work should law come in to help us when we can't use the natural motives. So then the government comes in to try to help. There's some reasons why the markets do not work to protect the environment, why the government needs to come in to help. We're going through the reasons now. One is because of a lack of information by consumers. They, even if consumers demand protection, if they do not have information, they do not know that this chair had environmental harm, if they do not have the information, then they cannot demand that in the market. So, and we mentioned yesterday, many environmental problems are very complicated. Only experts, you know, people that have PhDs, scientists, sometimes know the harms. So if only a few people even know what the harms are, we can't trust that consumers will have this information. Only the experts, maybe, will even have information what the risks are. So this is a reason why it's better for the government to uh, be in control of environmental protection because then they can hire scientists to find out what the harms are and act for the public benefit. Even if the public doesn't understand, the public doesn't even know it's in its benefit, but these scientists and experts realize it. Another problem was externalities, which is the external costs and external benefits. External costs means when a company does some action and there are effects, some of the costs, someone else pays the costs. So if they put chemicals into the air or into the water and some villagers get sick, those are costs that are part of the equation. But someone else pays those costs. The company does not pay the costs. These victims or the environment pays it. So it's an external cost. But also external benefits. If we put a regulation telling the company, you know, do not cut down these trees, then that's a benefit. The society is better because these this beautiful trees and this beautiful river is kept clean. But this benefit is paid, you know, someone else gets the benefit of the regulation. The company does not get the benefit of the beautiful river. They don't get any money from that. Society gets the benefit. So there are external costs and external benefits. This is a reason why it's good for the government to control it and not trust the company. Companies only care about internal costs and internal benefits. So we cannot trust them to care about the environment. Uh, we said environmental goods are not equal to money. That's another reason why transactions even if you, you know, people said, I'm willing to, you know, you can pay me and I'll let you destroy this forest. That's not really, that's a hard argument to make because the, the beauty of this river or forest is not equal to the money that you can give people. Then we talked about fairness and justice. I wrote this sentence to explain it. Lowering costs is good, but not everything. Also look at who bears the cost. If it is the poor, it is unfair. So this is an explanation. So markets are about lowering costs for everybody. So everybody can do the same job at the lowest possible cost. So if we, like in a toxic waste dump, it's very cheap to put the toxic waste in poor neighborhoods. So that means their product is cheaper. If I'm a consumer and buying this toxic chair, I can buy it for cheaper. We're saving, everybody's saving a lot of money. 
but the poor is bearing all the costs. So that's a justice problem. Lowering costs is a good idea in theory, but look at who bears the costs. If you see only poor people or vulnerable people bearing all the costs, that is a justice problem. Everybody's saving money, but it's unfair if one group is bearing all the costs. So let's also look to fairness and justice. This is another reason why the market is not good and we should have the government pay attention. The government can see that, notice the poor is bearing all the costs and you can have government regulation. You cannot have these dumps only in poor neighborhoods. It's unfair to them. That, that's something government regulation is good at and not the market. A reason why you would want the government regulation to come to control the market. I'm going to erase this up here. All right. So when we think about markets traditionally, we think about things like chairs and apples, things that people want that they buy. Is the beauty of the Irrawaddy River like a chair or an apple that you can buy? Yeah. So why, yeah, so it's not the same, but what's different? Why if people may want to be willing to pay, I'm willing to give you money if you clean up the Irrawaddy River. They may want to do that, but why is it not like a chair or apple? What's different about this case? Even you have some people that want to protect it and some people that want to pay for that, but what's different about it? Chair and apple. Yeah, what about them? It is uh, value in your feeling. In your feeling, yeah. Pepper is something you can eat and waste. You can grow the plant. Yeah. Waste good for the environment. But the chair is you need to cut down the, the tree. The tree, then we can make a chair. Okay. So maybe this is good. Well, okay, think about this. To get the apple, you know, if you want this apple, how, if you're the, I really want to have an apple, number one. And number two, I want a beautiful Irrawaddy River. All right. If I want an apple, what do I have to do? Okay, I either have to buy seeds and grow an apple tree and pick an apple, or I can just go to the store and buy an apple. Okay, I can just go to the store and buy an apple. But what about the Irrawaddy River? I want a beautiful Irrawaddy River. Is it just me? Is there some? Do I buy the beauty of the Irrawaddy River for myself? No. 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 To protect other people. All right. So we have a technical term for what's special about this kind of good. An apple is a private good. The uh, environmental goods are we call a public good. So things like the environment are called a public good. What a public good means, uh, the, the economic definition, the definition of a public good means Okay, the definition of a public good means you cannot exclude other people from the benefit. This is different from a private good. A private good like an apple or a chair means I, can ex I own this apple or this chair. I can exclude other people from the happiness. This is such, this is such a delicious apple. I love it. But you can't have it because I bought it and I bought it for my personal happiness. Yummy. <laughs> but a public good, something like the beauty of the Irrawaddy River, this is a public good. If I buy this, I'm not just buying it for my personal happiness. 
everybody shares the benefit. So there are many kinds of public goods. A public good, the very traditional example is a park. When a city builds a park, when you put in money to build a park, everybody can benefit from this park being built. Now the issue with public goods are This is the issue. The market undersupplies public goods. So, do you remember the market was about supply and demand? We really want to park. And then the park builders, we really want to build you a park. But the problem is, you know, maybe many thousands of people want to park. But they think, I don't have to pay for a park, other people are paying for the park. So I'll just leave it to them. They'll buy, they'll pay for the park, but then I can enjoy it anyway. So what ha ends up happening is even though you have demand by thousands of people that want this park, the market will undersupply it because only a few people will be willing to pay the money, pay the cost for the park. Only a few people will want to pay the cost because most people, many people, will be, this is the term we use, many people will be free riders. So does anyone know this, have ever heard of this term, free rider? No. Rider is in a sense of like riding a bike. Yes. What do you think the term means? What do you think free rider means? What does it sound like? Oh uh, well, it's not a literal bike rider. <laughs> not, not, you can go anywhere. not literal. Okay. What this means is a free rider means someone else pays for the costs and I enjoy what they paid for. So this means if I made this apple a public good and you could all have some apple, then some of you and I say please leave a donation for this wonderful apple that you got to eat. Some of you will not pay because you get apple anyway. Whether you pay or not, you still get the apple. I don't know why I'm talking about apples. We should use the park example. The city says, we want to build a park. Please give donations to build a park. Many people will not pay to build this park. They will not donate because they think, even if I do not give money, I will still get to enjoy the park. This is called a free rider. The sense is like the, the building of the park is like the bicycle. So they get, or, you know what, bus. It's like more like a bus. And you have a free bus line. And then the free rider is someone that gets to take a ride without paying for the fare. So we get to enjoy the park even though I didn't pay any costs. And I knew because it's a public good, someone else is going to pay for this park. Someone else is going to pay to clean up the river, the Irrawaddy River. I can enjoy that. I'm very happy to get the benefit from it. But since I don't have to pay, you know, I'll be a free rider. I will not pay for the, even though I'm getting benefit from it, I don't have to pay. So this is a problem for many environmental protections. There are many people that get the benefit of environmental protection, but they're not willing to pay for it. They, even though they would be willing to pay if it were just for themselves, but because it's a public good, the market will undersupply. Most people would rather just get the benefit without paying. So this leads us to Yeah, so many public goods public goods are very often not treated by the market at all. So like when you build a park Usually it's not a private transaction. Sometimes you have a neighborhood and they want to build a little park just for their street and they will all collect money. But very often, something like a park is paid by the city, right? You pay taxes and then the city buys it publicly. This is why usually you usually don't have private people buying a park. It's usually done by city regulation. 
So public goods are very often put outside the market. And then one reason is because they do not have clearly defined property rights. Nobody has a property right in the, in the park. So the, the issue about public goods, often it comes down to property rights. When people have a property right, they feel like they own something, then they're willing to pay a lot of money to protect what they own. The issue with the environment is no, nobody owns the environment. Nobody owns the beauty of the Irrawaddy River or the mountains in Kachin State or the forests up there. Nobody owns those. Those are public goods. And so because nobody has specific property rights, then they will not pay as much to protect it. People will pay a lot of money to protect something they privately have a property right in, to protect their property, but people, it's very difficult for them to pay money for something that they do not have a property, that's not their property. So you usually require government action to, if you wanted to pay to protect these forests and mountains, you usually need government action. You cannot rely on people, private people, trying to protect it. So this, this problem leads to something that has a name. We even have a name for this problem. I'm going to erase this. Which is? Okay. Yes. What about if uh, the government or an organization cut the money from the public? So they said, they were said, we will be a park or maybe we will use the money for the benefits for the public, for the people. Then if they don't use the money properly and can use the other way, what that be? Well, this is political action then. So once you start talking about government money and people authorizing the government, we're talking about political action. Political action works very differently from market action. Well, there's an argument. Some people question, but uh, market transactions are like, you know, I want to buy something so that I can get be enjoyment, a benefit from it. I will pay money and then I'll get a benefit. And that would be like, you know, I would pay money to create the park, I get a benefit. But government action is works very differently. You know, you have tax money. You have to pay the tax money no matter what. And then it's a matter of politicians having support, you know, wanting to get reelected, having interest groups that persuade them. It works very differently. And also, you know, uh, now that Burma has something like elections, you know, when you go to vote, you think about different things than when you go to a shop to buy something, right? You know, when you buy an apple, you're only thinking about your personal, what you need. I really want to have this delicious apple, so I will get exactly what makes me happy. But when you go to vote, you're not thinking only about what makes me personally happy. You think about other things, right? What else might you think with public action, like when you vote? What other things are you thinking about? Yeah, what's in the best interest for the whole society? You're not thinking about... So that makes it... Yeah, markets are not good with public goods because public goods are in the interest of all of us. But when you go for market transactions, you know, a company is thinking about profit. A company does not think about the public good when it does some, you know, if they're wanting to cut down trees, they want to cut down trees in the cheapest way possible. They're not thinking about the public interest. And when people are buying chairs, they're only thinking about what's the most comfortable chair to sit in, or what's the cheapest chair. They're not often thinking about where the wood is coming from and the social good. But when you go to vote, or when politicians act, they're supposed to, sometimes they don't, but they're supposed to think, we're expected to think about what's good for all of society. And that's why sometimes it's much better to treat environmental problems through government action than the market because we're expected for government action to think about the public good, what's for the good of all of us. But it's especially for public goods. It's particularly important. Anyway, the name of this problem is called, there's actually a name of the problem, and it's called the tragedy of the commons. 
Does anyone know this term commons? We have a commons here in the school. A commons is a noun. A commons is a land. Uh, a commons is. I mean, a commons is a land that's a public good. So it's like a park. So everybody can share this land. And often we like this garden here. We would call this garden for PLA. We would call this the commons because all the students can share. You know, as opposed to like someone's private bedroom. You don't want to just walk into someone's private bedroom. But for a commons area, we can all share it. So there's a famous problem called the tragedy of the commons, which means, you know, you have a hundred people. They're all allowed to take care, you know, they're all allowed to share this park. They can go and play uh, whatever sport you play, badminton. You know, they can play sports in this. Uh, and then we worry about the grass. So we try to have a rule like, uh, please do not walk too much on the grass. So the tragedy of the commons is every individual person thinks, yes, we need to follow this rule for everybody else, but me personally, it's okay if I cheat a little because my contribution to the problem is very small. You know what I mean? So I can run on the grass, but the other 99 people, they shouldn't. If all 100 of us ran on the grass, we would destroy the park, and it would be ugly. But for me personally, if I just ran by myself, it would be only a small harm, so it wouldn't, you know, it's okay for me, as long as you don't do it. Now, what's the problem with this logic? What's the problem with this logic? It's okay for me to run, but the other 99 people shouldn't. Is the, What's going to happen to the park? The park is not for public good. Well, no, we're, we're, we're saying it's for 100 people. We're saying it's for the public good. Here we have a park. There's 100 people in this town. And we have a rule. If all, if all 100 people run on the grass, it will destroy the grass. So we have a rule, don't run. Yes, yeah, so nobody run. Okay, so now you have one person, but there's no policeman. No one's watching. It's just a rule we keep for ourselves. We agree among each other. So now, and we all agree. We all, all 100 people, we all agree. We want to protect the park. We don't want to see our beautiful park destroyed. So we don't want to run to protect our park. We all agree on this. We've all agreed on this in advance. So this is self-enforcing. There's no police officer that's making us not run. But we all want to keep our beautiful park. So we agree among ourselves not to run. But one person thinks to himself, OK, but if 99 people don't run, but only I run, only me by myself, then the, gar the, the park will still be OK. Because my running is very small contribution. So it's OK for me to run. Only the other 99 people don't have to run. And then, and then I get the double benefit. I get a beautiful garden, uh, I get a beautiful park, and I get to run in it. So I get the best of both. You know, what's the problem with this logic? Yeah, he said exactly what the problem. If one person says I can run, one person says that, every one, every, all 100 people will think the same thing. And if you have 100 people saying, I personally can run, but the other 99 people can't, if all 100 people think the same way, then you'll have all 100 people running, and the park will be destroyed. That's called the tragedy of the commons. This is one of the problems with the public good. When you have the, you cannot exclude other people from the benefit. So... If you can't exclude other people from the benefit, then each individual will want to take the benefit and abuse it. Everyone will, every individual has an incentive to be a free rider, to abuse their rights. But if all of them abuse their rights, then you end up destroying the park. Tragedy of the commons. And the reason is, is because uh, nobody can exclude. If it's not a property right, you can't stop people from running. It was an agreement we made with each other. You know, if it were a private park, then the owner could just say, if you run, you're excluded. That's the advantage of a property right. A property right 
property right means you can exclude you can exclude violators. If there's a property right in the park, then if you see someone running, you can just say, you know, you're out of the park. You can exclude them. But if it's a commons, it's much harder to exclude people in the commons. So everyone has an incentive to free ride and to abuse. So this is a very hard problem with climate change, something like climate change, because the, the, the commons we're talking about with climate change is the entire atmosphere of the earth. Everybody owns the atmosphere of the earth. And every time we use electricity, we're putting a little carbon. So each individual, you're not putting very much. But if you add all 6 billion humans, it's a lot of contribution. But every individual is thinking just like you and me. You know, I think, what electricity do I use during the day? You know, I turn on the lights, I use my computer to watch some movies. It's just a little electricity. So it's not a big deal for me individually. But six billion people think just like me. And if you add all six billion of us up, that's a huge contribution. So it's very, very difficult to deal with this kind of problem. Like because you have to, uh, it's very difficult to restrict one person. You have to have some kind of sanction usually. If people knew that if they violated, if you change this rule and say, if you run, you will get punished, you know, maybe we agree, uh, maybe we agree collectively, we'll exclude violators. We all agree together. If I, you know, even I agree, if, even if I cheat, you should exclude me, even if I do it. If you have some kind of sanction, then you can persuade people. So there are ways to deal with the tragedy of the commons, but it's a difficult problem. Uh, another thing, not only is it hard to, uh, you know, everyone has the incentive to cheat, I want to talk about the incentive to cheat. This, the part that says, I can run, this is the incentive to cheat. So another issue with the tragedy of the commons, not why people have an incentive to cheat, let's think about in climate change. There's a rule, do not emit carbon. Do not emit so much carbon. Uh, okay, let's say there's a hundred companies. We're going to change this rule to the climate change example. You have a hundred companies and they give themselves a rule. Do not emit more than like 10,000 tons, I don't know, a thousand tons. One thousand tons of carbon. Okay. So you have these. This is this very small planet, and there are only a hundred companies in the whole world, and all one hundred of them come to an agreement. If all of us emit too much carbon, we will all suffer. Everyone will pay the costs and it will be a much worse world. So we all agree, do not emit more than 1,000 tons of carbon. If we all follow this rule, then we can all do our business and the earth stays clean. There's less, there's no climate change. So this is a good rule. So, but some of them are gonna get the idea, maybe I can cheat. And let's think about this, the incentive to cheat. If 99 companies follow the rule, If they emit less carbon, what, that, what this means is their, uh, their product will be more expensive. So the more people that follow the rule, their product will be more expensive because they're following the rule. People that follow the rule pay the cost. So this means the incentive to cheat 
incentive. What's going to happen to the incentive to cheat? If other people's product is get more and more expensive, what do I think? I want to make the biggest profit. To make it cheaper. Yeah, the incentive to cheat goes up. The more people that follow the rule, the more money I will make cheating. If only one person follows the rule, then if I cheat, I don't make so much money. But if 99 people follow the rule, then my and I'm the only one person that cheats, then I will have the cheapest product and everybody will buy my product. I'll put all 99 of them out of business. So this is the this is the paradox, the problem of the tragedy of the commons. The more people that follow the rule, the more incentive I have to cheat. It's even better for me to cheat. If 50 people follow the rule, then I'm competing with 50, you know, the other 50 people. But if 99 people follow the rule, I'm not competing with anybody. I'm the best. So I have even more incentive to cheat. This makes something like climate change very hard. The more companies that commit to not emitting carbon, then the more money cheaters will make. Cheaters make more money when their products are cheaper and out because other people are following the rules. So it makes it very difficult economically. It's a very, prob it's a very hard problem economically. Maybe the law is very simple. It's very simple to create a law do not emit more than a thousand tons in carbon in some region. It's very easy to write it as a law. But when we look at the economics and incentives, it's very hard to enforce because companies have a very high incentive to cheat. And even, even the rule is making giving them more reason to cheat. Do you see what's perverse about it, what makes it very difficult? The very fact other people are following the rule makes me want to cheat even more because I'll make even more money. The more people that follow the rule, the even the more money I make cheating. So this is a very difficult problem. This comes up in so many different issues. This is like fishing. Another issue I worked on where this comes up is fishing. You know, if everybody, if all the fishermen goes out and catches fish, then we will catch all the fish and then there will be less for the next year maybe there will be no fish left. So then all the fishermen agree, okay, let's only catch 500 fish, or like 500 pounds of fish. So we all agree, this is better for all of us fishermen, we're all agreeing, we only catch 500 pounds of fish, then we will have more fish in the future and we can continue making money. It's the same problem. One fisherman's gonna think, if, uh, if all these other fishermen are following the rule, if I cheat, I'll make more money. But every individual fisherman has the same incentive. So there are many problems where this comes up, where we have, everybody want, this is the pro issue, even they want to follow the rule. All the fishermen agree, we want to preserve the fish. Our life depends on fish, so we need fish in the future. So all of us agree, we do not want to overfish. Even when the fishermen agree, we want to not overfish. Individually, they want to cheat. Even when they all agree it's good for all of us to follow the rule, it's very hard to uh, get an incentive for each individual to follow the rule. The economics gives them such a strong desire to cheat as other people are following the rules. So this is something law always has to deal with. All right. For this is number five. So this is number five problem with one, two, three, four, five problem with markets. We only have two more. Only two more. Only two more. Only two more problems, but I'll talk about them more quickly because this is, I think, the most important one. I think this is the most important issue that uh, law has to deal with. That markets are very diff hard to deal with public goods and the, the strong incentive for people wanting to cheat and to abuse commons, public goods. Uh, where should I write it? Has everyone written this down? Yes, you can read this down. Anyone else like this?
All right, number six is preferences. So we talked earlier, markets are about uh, demand and profit motive, but it's what consumers demand. So we're thinking about people that want to protect the environment. They are willing to pay. I'm willing to pay money for you not to cut down this forest or to keep the Irrawaddy River clean. I'm willing to pay money for that even. But even when I'm willing to do that, markets have a difficult time dealing with it because they have a hard time dealing with preferences. Do you, does anyone know the, what the term preference means? Oh. Preferences means what people desire. So even when people want to protect the environment, sometimes it's difficult to figure out what their preferences are. One is, again, going back to the lack of information. If people don't know what the problem is, then they won't have a preference about it. If I don't know the difference, if I don't know one of these chairs will cause harm and one of these won't, then I don't have any preference of one chair over another. Markets only work when people have clear preferences. If I don't have information, then I won't have a preference, and the market can't deal with it. Then. Uh, and th yeah, and then I so part of that was lack of info or uh, I talked a little about this earlier. Production risk versus product risk. Uh, like with the coffee, if there's some poison in the coffee that makes me sick, I'll have a strong incentive not to buy it. If, if this coffee makes me sick, then the next time I go to the store, I will not buy this coffee. <laughs> I will not buy this coffee because the product risk, I have a very strong preference against product risk in the coffee. But for production risk, that's much harder because you cannot see the, the production means, production is how it was made. The product is what's inside the coffee itself. The production is how it was made. So the product risk, we can see. I can, you know, sometimes you can't. You don't know what the product risk is, but you know if, if you see on the news people are getting sick from this coffee, then you know there's a risk of this product. I don't want to buy it. But the production, it's hidden. I cannot see how the coffee was made when I look at it, the coffee itself. Coffee looks all the same no matter what I look at it. So when we had this issue with the villages in South America being abused to make this coffee, I can't see just looking at the coffee. I don't know whether this coffee was abusive or not for these villagers in South America. Or the wood, I don't know what kind of forests were cleared for the part, actually forests are usually cleared for agriculture. So when I buy some rice or some fruit, I don't know what forest was cleared or what people had to be, ethnic group had to be moved uh, with this deforestation to plant this field of rice. Because rice all looks the same. You don't know where it comes from. So that's a problem with preferences. And, and then sometimes people just have uh, they don't understand their preferences. They don't know what they want. You know, if you tell people complicated stories, you know, some experts are saying this will be good for the environment. Or some, some experts are saying this chemical they're putting in the river will be very bad for the environment. Some people are saying it won't be a problem at all. And the individuals, they won't know what to believe, so they'll have mixed preferences. Uh, sometimes they overvalue. Sometimes over sometimes people overvalue or undervalue risks. People are also irrational. 
Like they will overvalue some risks and undervalue others. So for example, I mean in America, one of the leading causes of death, one of the leading causes of death in the world are just household people tripping and falling. But you don't think about that as an extreme danger. You know what I mean? Even though it's one of the leading causes of death. Or car accidents. You know, one of the another leading cause of death are like car accidents or motorbike. People dying on motorbikes. But you do not think of a motorbike as a deadly weapon. And then some people will think, you know, this chemical will scare them a lot. That people are not scared of motorbikes. Even though the motorbikes may kill a lot more people. So People may overvalue or undervalue risks. They, they think about risks in terms of how they see it, but they don't always know what the actual risk is. Do you know what I mean? Like the difference between like a chemical and a motorbike. A motorbike may kill a lot more people, but people may be a lot more scared of the chemical. Because the chemical is, uh, you know, it's foreign, it's alien. This company, you know, when I ride a bike, I consented to it. Because I, I like riding it, I like the danger or whatever. I don't mind the risk because it's very convenient to me. But for this chemical, you know, some company I don't even know gave it to me without my consent. So maybe that's a reason. But all sorts of things may go into how people think about risks. But they may not think about the risks in terms of the actual harms. All sorts of values come into play. So they may, sometimes they may overvalue. They, they may want to put a lot of money in a good example is whenever you have a small group that gets uh, trapped in some kind of, uh, like, there's always a story about this guy that takes a trip on a boat and there's a storm and he's lost at sea. So then the government will spend like a million dollars to get all these helicopters flying looking for the guy. You know, the one person. You're trying to save the life of one person, and then it'll be on TV, and they're spending all this money to save one person. And you think, wow, if they would have spent, all, if they would have put that money into like traffic lights or better stop signs, we could save so many lives with this money. But people care about this one life because it's on TV. So in a, you can say they're kind of overvaluing that risk. They're putting in so much money to save this one guy, and then they're undervaluing all these other people that are getting killed for other reasons. So this is an issue to deal with for preferences. Sometimes it's hard to figure out, you know, how do you value life? Should every life have the same value or, you know, or uh, when you think about species that die, that go extinct. Some people think, you know, if we lose this rhinoceros, that's a lot worse than losing this beetle. But maybe not from the beetle's point of view. <laughs> You know, how do you judge one more important than the other? And, you know, how reliable is people's, what people think? Sometimes people fear things that aren't really risky. And sometimes people do not fear things that really are risky. Markets have a very difficult time if people can't agree on what is the actual risk. Okay, so preferences. Does anyone have any questions about what preferences mean? Markets are about people buying what they want, but sometimes people don't know what they want, or they're mistaken what they want. They want you to help this problem, but actually if they thought about it, if they had more information, they would change their own minds. So sometimes even when people think they know what they want, sometimes they can be, you know, they can be irrational. So. Markets have a problem when people are confused about their own preferences. So sometimes it's better for government action to come in and say, we understand what you think, but the experts tell us this is where the real risks are, so this is where we should put the money. This will be better for the social good. This will be better for all of us, even though you may not understand why, but we have experts telling us. You know, but then people, you know, Sometimes people disagree with the governments. Sometimes you don't want to trust the government telling you what's in your best interest either. You know, they have perverse incentives. The company will have its own opinions too. You know, a preference is an issue for markets. And then the very last problem.
with markets protecting the environment is transaction costs. You know what? A, does anyone know what a transaction cost is? What's that? A convention? Commercial? Well, commercial what? <laughs> yeah, it's involved with commercial activity. What's a transaction? What's a transaction? A trade. Yeah. A trade. A transaction is when two people have an agreement, some market transaction, an agreement or a trade. One person has money, one person has apples, they have a transaction. He gets the money, he gets the apples. That's a transaction. Anytime you have a transaction, there are costs. There are some costs. For very simple transactions, it's a very cheap cost. Only you have to drive to the store, and the store has to buy the product from somewhere else and it has to be shipped in on trucks. So usually transaction costs are cheap for some things. But for other examples, they're very expensive. So let's think about something like climate change. Who are, who are the victims of climate change? Everybody. Everybody. Okay, so six billion people are the victims. And who's causing climate change? Well, who's, who's using electric, who uses electricity? Everybody. Everybody. Okay, so you have six billion, you have six billion buyers and you have six billion sellers. You have six billion people that are the victims of global warming, and you have six billion people contributing with electricity. The transaction cost of having them all agree with each other would be huge. You could never get all these people around a table to come to an agreement. So in this case, the idea of having a market transaction to solve global warming, it, just, it doesn't make any sense at all. There's no way. The transaction cost would be so high. You could never get everybody to agree. So therefore, this is why we let governments control it, because governments can come together and draft a treaty. That's much easier to do than having all the victims and people contributing coming to agree themselves. It's much easier to just let the governments negotiate. But that, it's not a market transaction anymore. Now it's government action. Uh, government action has a cost, though, too which we call government action is not free either. So transaction costs are for markets. For governments, we have administrative costs. Administrative costs are all the, so even if we switch from transaction costs from a market to a government action, we're not getting it for free. We don't get the agreement for free then either. Now we have administrative costs. But very often, administrative costs are much cheaper than transaction costs. It depends. Sometimes the transaction cost is cheaper. Sometimes it's, for example, we talked about the, um, the factory on a river, and it puts something uh, into the chemical in the river, and then there's some neighborhoods down the street and they get affected by this. Or the real world example I used was pig farming. Pig farming smell has a very bad smell, I've read. And then so the neighborhoods around the pig farm will have this terrible smell that will come into their houses. So for this, you know, the transaction cost would be the, the people of the neighborhood going to the pig farm and saying, would you please compensate us for this terrible smell. So we can either move away or just pay us for the smell. And then for that, the transaction cost might not be. Maybe it's good to let them agree and have a transaction cost. Just have a transaction, have a market agreement. So then the company pays for the right to put up the smelly pig smell. Uh, whereas administrative costs, you have to bring in some government agency. So in the pig smell case, Maybe the transaction costs are cheaper and then, than the administrative costs. But for something like climate change, the administrative costs are much cheaper than the transaction costs. So, but the main lesson here is every kind of, um, 
every kind of agreement, every kind of solution, there's always a cost. You always have to pay to get people to agree, to find a solution. Either you're paying transaction costs, getting people together to agree, and having debates. And what if people want different things? You have to pay even more money to get the information. Or you have administrative costs. We have some government agency, and you have to hire experts that get all the information. And then the government officials come to some solution and that the people are happy with. There's always costs to play. But transaction costs can be very expensive uh, for many, many environmental cases. So that makes markets also a problem for markets to handle. So, okay, so here are seven problems with markets handling the environment. These are seven reasons why we want government action. These are the seven problems we want government action to solve. Let's think of some solutions now, where government action can give us some solutions to some of these problems. Like lack of information, how can the government help this problem? Transparency. Transparency? Yeah, they can. What does that mean practically? Yeah, the government can require transparency, but what's in terms of an actual law or rule? What does that mean? If we want the mar we say we yeah. say we want the market to work, but it needs a little help. We can fix a few things. How can we fix the market to try to work? So how can we give consumers information? Transparency is good, but what does that mean in terms of an actual law? What would the law look like? How, how would you make them be transparent? Yeah, that's good. Make them make declarations. So have, have a requirement. You have to fill out a form giving us certain information, and then we will post this publicly so consumers can go. NGOs can go to this website, and they can see what your environmental impacts are. Positive publicity. Publicity, yeah, private publicity. Have publicity. Uh, transparency, the actual mechanism you would use is an environmental impact assessment. They have to register like an environmental impact assessment. So they say, this is what we expect we will do to the environment. They put this up on a website, now we can see it. Uh, yeah, publicity campaigns. Publishing book. And then I mentioned the other one right there. Yes. Can you give an example uh, specifically with uh, one issue or one 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 thing about uh, how how to make more information? Well, the the first example I used was these two chairs. This metal came from two different mines. One of these mines put mercury into the water. Many villagers got sick, and one of these mines came from a safe mine that had very high standards. But if you look at the two chairs, they physically look the same. So they have a lack of information. So how could the government try to fix this? So one is an environmental impact assessment. We could look at the company, and if they have to register the impact assessment for making this chair, then some NGO, you know, consumers aren't going to look at this, but some NGOs will. If there's an environmental impact assessment, the NGOs will look, go on the internet and they'll find this impact assessment and they will say, wow, this is like really awful impacts they're having. Or the government will just not approve. You know, if it's really bad impacts, the government may just not approve of it. But if it's something that's kind of bad, enough to be legal, but still something consumers are not happy about, then the NGOs can read this impact assessment and have a publicity campaign and say, do not buy from this chair. It looks like a good chair, but don't, you know, they organize some boycott against this chair manufacturer for their abuses or the coffee maker. So, yeah, any kind of goods. Uh, sometimes you can't get public pressure. If it's like a gas company, oil company, you know, consumers do not buy from oil companies directly. You buy from the gas station. You know, when you want to fill up your motorbike, you go to the gas station and fill it up. So you're not buying from the oil company directly, you're buying from the station, and the station buys it from the company. So it's harder to put the pressure if you cannot do transaction directly with uh, the oil company. That's one challenge. Labels were another one. The government could require, if you, if the government required a literal label, you 
you know, about this chair. They do that with cigarettes. I don't know if they do that in Burma, but in America, there's a requirement to put a label that cigarettes are dangerous. Uh, okay. Well, I heard... We will do five and a half minutes. Huh? I'll go five minutes. Okay. Well, let's just walk through what can we do with externalities? What's a way that we can help this problem? Remember, this is like the costs were outside the company. These victims get sick. How do we make the company bear these costs? How do you make the company pay for the cost of victims getting sick? Yeah. What's that? Pay a compensation. Yeah, and why do they have to pay compensation? Where does that come from? Yeah, if they have a suit, if you have a suit, if you have a lawsuit and they have to pay compensation, then that will internalize these costs. If you internalize the cost to the company, now suddenly these, the, the victims getting sick is not an externality. Now it's a cost inside the company's profit. It cuts from their profit. And companies want the highest profit, so they want to get rid of that cost. The easiest way for them to get rid of the cost is to stop the harm. If they stop the harm, then they can make more profit. They can, maybe even the government, they can, they can have the, the law that uh, if you want to, uh, even you want to do mining, and also uh, like a building company, uh, maybe like like a uh, train, that's near to the a river or something, else, and you can you can have a qualification like if you want to do that, and then you have to avoid uh, avoid uh, from violation uh, the other human rights or something. Yeah, that's regulation. And does that internalize the cost? Uh, yes, that's, that's, that's mean, uh, if you uh, if you uh, stop the, the harm, and then maybe uh, you will not uh, have to pay for the losses. Right, yeah. So that's internalizing. If they stop the harm, they will not have to pay costs later on. It internalizes the cost, and all of a sudden, the company's thinking the normal market profit, even just trying to make a profit, that thinking alone will make them stop the harm. Also the external benefits, uh, sometimes if a company, they want to know what do I gain from regulating, sometimes may want to have what's called a side payment. This is a solution. So a solution here is a lawsuit. Lawsuit internalizes cost. So one solution to the external costs is a lawsuit internalizes the cost. One solution to the external benefit, remember an external benefit was uh, the landowner does not cut trees. I want, to, I want to protect these trees, I do not cut them down, but the landowner does not get any money for not cutting down trees. Other people are getting the benefit of the protection. So one way that we can internalize the benefit is a side payment. All the people that are very happy that you cut down trees, maybe we collect money together and we pay the farmer or we pay the uh, landowner for not cutting down the trees. We give them a side payment. That internalizes the benefit. So this could be, for example, in the, the form of government subsidies. You want to re sometimes you want to reward companies for doing the right thing. The company protects the environment. We get social benefit. If there's some social benefit from that, maybe the government could collect money for that benefit and give it to the landowner as a reward for giving happy, you know, to giving this benefit to the society. This is called a side payment. It's a way to reward companies for doing the right thing. So that, but what it means in economic terms is it internalizes the benefit. So they actually see a profit from doing the right thing. 
this is also good for like the, the fishermen, you know, rewarding fishermen that follow the rules. We're talking about the incentive to cheat. Well, if you if you rewarded fishermen that followed the rules with a side payment, then that would give them less incentive to cheat. Internalizing benefits. Uh, fairness and justice, that would be kind of regulation. Okay, let's stop there for the class. Thank you, Jerry. You're welcome.